we shall start now dr preeti a very good afternoon to one and all i dr preeti rawat on behalf of department of botany deshbandhu college extend a very warm welcome to all the respected faculties research scholars and students from different colleges who have joined us today in celebrating the world wetlands day world wetlands day is recognized as united nation international day of importance it is celebrated around the world each year on 2nd of february it marks the anniversary of signing of the convention on wetlands of international importance in ramsar iran on 2nd of february 1971 World Wetlands Day is celebrated each year to raise global awareness about wetlands. Wetlands play a critical role in maintaining many natural cycles and supporting a wide range of biodiversity. They purify and replenish our water, serve as a natural sponge against flooding and drought, protect our coastlines and help fight climate change. But sadly, due to various anthropogenic activities over the last 300 years, approximately 87% of the wetlands have been lost globally destruction of wetlands can lead to serious consequences such as increased flooding extinction of species and decline in water quality so by protecting the wetlands we not only protect ourselves but we also ensure a healthy future for our planet with the aim to raise global awareness about the vital role of wetlands for people and planet today we all have assembled here in virtual mode to listen to the talk by our distinguished speaker for today dr gurmeet singh who is an eminent scientist at national center of sustainable coastal management chennai which is an institute under ministry of environment and forest and climate change government of india but before we start with today's talk it is our holy tradition to worship goddess saraswati before we begin any event so let's dedicate our prayers to ma saraswati and seek her blessings uh, for this i would like to invite uh, ms muskan to play the video for of uh, saraswati vandana over to you muskan Thank you, Ms. Khan, for playing the video. Now, I would like to invite our ever smiling and enthusiastic teacher in charge, Dr. Aparna Nautiyar, to give the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon and namaste to all of you. On behalf of Department of Botany, Deshbandhu College, I, Aparna Nautiyar, welcome you all to celebrate World Wetland Day. which is celebrated on 2nd february every year to mark the adoption of the ramsar convention on wetlands since 1971 this day plays an important role to create 
global awareness about the important role of wetlands for the people and the mother earth wetlands action for people and nature is the theme in the year 2022 highlighting the importance of actions to ensure the conservation and sustainable use of wetlands for the human and planetary health i wholeheartedly welcome our eminent speaker dr gurmeet singh ji who is scientist national center for sustainable coastal management ministry of environment and forest government of india for gracing the occasion and sparing his valuable time for delivering the talk. We welcome you, sir. Thank you so much. I welcome and express my sincere gratitude to our hardworking, dedicated leader of our institution, our respected principal, Professor Rajiv Agarwal, for his constant support and encouragement in all the progressive work being done in the college. I also express my gratitude to our encouraging and supportive vice principal, Professor Kamal Kumar Gupta, our hardworking IQAC convener, Dr. Aditya Saxena, and DBT Star Scheme Coordinator, Dr. Indrikumar Indrikan Singh, for all time to time guidance and motivation. I also want to express my gratitude towards the contribution which uh, was done by our senior faculty, former faculty members, as well as our beloved late Dr. Dharmendra Kumar Malik for giving all his contribution and uh, in the progress and the development of this department. I also welcome our all uh, faculty members from our own college as well as from other universities, department, uh, departments, and all the students who have come here to participate to celebrate World Wetland Day. I also congratulate and I also appreciate the sincere efforts which were put up by the hardworking, multi-talented event coordinators, Dr. Anju Chibbar and Dr. Madhurani, all the faculty and the students team who have conceptualized this idea of inter-college event in the morning and this webinar today on the occasion of World Wetland Day. I am very much hopeful that the talk by Dr. Gurmeet Singh would be the fruitful and the informative one for all the audience. So my all the best wishes to all of you. And I uh, thanks all of you for the, your participation. And uh, with these words, I would now request Dr. Preeti Rawat to kindly continue the session. Over to you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, due to some urgent work that has come up, our principal sir and vice principal sir will not be able to join us today. Though they are not present with us right now, but their blessings and good wishes always motivate us to do our best. I would now like, uh, I now request our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Aditya Saxena, to address the audience and motivate our students. Over to you, sir. Dr. Preeti. Sir, Pratham, I am very happy to be here today. और विशिष्ट वक्ता डॉक्टर गुरमीत सिंह जी जो कि वैज्ञानिक हैं फ्यूचरिस्टिक रिसर्च डिवीजन नेशनल सेंटर फॉर सस्टेनेबल कोस्टल मैनेजमेंट मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एनवायरनमेंट एंड फॉरेस्ट उनका मैं स्वागत करता हूं देशबंधु महाविद्यालय परिवार की ओर से और आंतरिकी गुणवत्ता सुनिश्चित प्रकोष्ठ की ओर से साथ ही मैं बहुत-बहुत स्वागत करता हूं हमारे सभी अध्यापकगण जो अन्य महाविद्यालयों से जिन्होंने यहां पे आज हमारे साथ जो सम्मिलित हुए हैं हमारे सारे शोधार्थियों का और विद्यार्थियों का जो भी आज इस जो ये इनकी हमारे डॉक्टर गुरमीत सिंह जी के जो वक्तव्य है उसको सुनने के लिए जो यहाँ पे कत्रित हुए हैं साथ ही मैं धन्यवाद करना चाहूँगा हमारे माननीय प्रिंसिपल प्राचार्य प्रोफेसर राजीव अग्रवाल जी का जिनका कि हमेशा ये सतत प्र कि हमारा महाविद्यालय इस तरह के कार्यक्रमों का आयोजन करता रहे, जिससे कि केवल जो एक विद्यार्जन का कार्य हमारे महाविद्यालय के पास है, तो वो सिर्फ कक्षाओं तक ही सीमित ना रहे, बल्कि उसका एक समग्र रूप से विकास हो सके और हमारे विद्यार्थियों को एक समग्र ज्ञान की प्राप्ति हो सके। उसी श्रृंखला में आज का � साथ ही हमारे 
माननीय उप प्रधानाचार्य महोदय प्रोफेसर कमल कुमार गुप्ता जी जिनका कि हमेशा ही हम सब लोगों को स्नेह और बहुत ही एक हम लोग को प्रोत्साहन प्राप्त होता रहता है डॉक्टर इंद्रकांत सिंह जो कि कोऑर्डिनेटर हैं हमारे डीपीटी स्टार कॉलेज स्कीम के उनका भी समय समय पे हम लोगों को बहुत एक प्रोत्साहन भी और मार्गदर्शन भी प्राप्त होता रहता है विशेष रूप से मैं आभारी हूँ डॉक्टर अपर्णा नौटियाल का जो कि प्रभारी हैं हमारे वनस्पति विज्ञान विभाग की और जिन्होंने आज के इस कार्यक्रम का आयोजन करा है और जो आज के इस कार्यक्रम के संयोजक हैं डॉक्टर अंजू छिबर जी और डॉक्टर मधुरानी जी कोस्टल वेटलैंड्स के बारे में मैं तो वैसे भौतिक का विद्यार्थी हूं तो इसलिए कोस्टल वेटलैंड्स के बारे में बहुत ज्यादा जानकारी तो नहीं है और इसीलिए आज हम सब लोग बहुत ही उत्सुक हैं डॉक्टर गुरमीत सिंह जी को सुनने के लिए लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि आज के परिवेश में जो आज का एक सामाजिक और कहना चाहिए कि वातावरण का जो परिवेश है जिसके अंदर बहुत ही हम लोगों के पूरे कहना चाहिए कि मानव जाति के सामने बहुत ही सारी चुनौतियां हैं उन चुनौतियों में से कई सारी चुनौतियों का समाधान मेरे राय में कोस्टल वेटलैंड्स हमें प्रदान करते हैं क्योंकि ये जो है ना ही सिर्फ जो कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड एमिशन है उसको कम करते हैं या उसको नियंत्रित करते हैं साथ ही ये जो समय समय पे बाढ़ या समुद्री तूफान या और इस तरह की जो आपदाएं हैं उनसे भी हमें बचाते हैं और इस समय जिस गति से जैसे भी बताया भी गया कि जिस गति से इनको नष्ट किया जा रहा है या ये क्षीण हो रही हैं उसके कई सारे कारण हैं उन कारणों पे तो मेरे ख्याल से आज डॉक्टर गुरमीत सिंह जी प्रकाश डालेंगे पर यह है कि हम लोगों के लिए जानना बहुत जरूरी है कि वो कारण क्या है और हम लोग उसमें क्या योगदान दे सकते हैं जिससे कि हम उन कारणों को रोकें और इन वेटलैंड्स को सुरक्षित और इनका संरक्षण में हम भी अपना सहयोग दे सकें गुरमीत सिंह सर मैं इसमें थोड़ा सा बताना चाहूंगा कि हमारा महाविद्यालय भी अपनी तरफ से ये छोटा मोटा प्रयास करता है कि हम भी पर्यावरण को वातावरण को कुछ अपनी तरफ से दे सकें तो, तो उसी श्रृंखला में हम लोगों ने एक रेन वाटर हार्वेस्टिंग सिस्टम डेवलप किया है जो कि जो हमारे महाविद्यालय के प्रांगण में पीछे हमने ग्रीन बेल्ट बनाई है उस ग्रीन बेल्ट को ही एक सस्टेनेबल रेन वाटर हार्वेस्टिंग सिस्टम के फॉर्म में डेवलप किया है और उसमें हमारा ये प्रयास है कि उसके माध्यम से हम ग्राउंड वाटर टेबल के लेवल को भी बढ़ा सकें और कम से कम अपने महाविद्यालय में जो भी पानी बारिश का पानी का अर्थ है उसको हम सही तरह से उसका उपयोग कर सकें तो इसके साथ ही पूरा एक बहुत ही अच्छा ग्रीन बेल्ट हम लोगों ने डेवलप किया है और भी कई इस तरह के हम लोगों ने नए नए इनिशिएटिव्स लिए हैं जिसमें कि हमारे वनस्पति विज्ञान विभाग का बहुत ही बड़ा योगदान है तो मेरे ख्याल से उन लोगों ने आज इस वक्तव्य का आपके इस टॉक का जो आयोजन किया है मेरे ख्याल से ये हम लोगों के लिए बहुत ही अच्छा रहेगा कि जो हमारे अपने प्रयास है उसमें भी हम लोगों को बहुत बल मिलेगा और आपके मार्गदर्शन से मुझे पूरा यकीन है कि हम लोग आगे और भी कुछ कर पाएंगे सर इसी के साथ आपका फिर से एक बार स्वागत है डॉक्टर प्रीति आप आप आगे कंटिन्यू करें Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your motivational words and words of wisdom. Uh, so you have been a constant source of motivation and encouragement for all of us. Thank you once again. I would now like to request my fellow colleague, Dr. Madhu Rani, to introduce our guest speaker for today for the talk. Uh, over to you, Dr. Madhu. Thank you, Dr. Piti. Uh, i will request yes thank you so much uh, our students are uh, they are just expert in everything we don't need to even uh, utter the word <laughs> they do the needful thank you so much uh, a few days back uh, when we were planning about uh, how to celebrate this uh, world wetlands day and how to uh, tell our students about the importance of this day we were puzzled how to make this memorable we approached our guest speaker for today who very humbly and at such a short notice he accepted our invitation to deliver the talk on the occasion and it gives me a great joy to introduce our respected invited speaker for today's webinar dr gurmeet singh sir uh, dr singh completed his mphil and phd at the school of environmental sciences jawaharlal nehru university presently dr singh is working as a scientist at the futuristic research division of national center for sustainable coastal management Ministry of Environment and the uh, uh, Forest Government of India which is situated in Tamil Nadu Dr Singh has been working in the domain of coastal biogeochemistry for the last 15 years 
he has uh, more than uh, 50 publications and presentations to his credit he has worked extensively on carbon burial and nutrient dynamics on coastal ecosystems his current area of interest is the blue carbon ecosystem and climate change and today he will be delivering a talk on coastal wetlands and climate change we welcome you sir and express our heartfelt gratitude for accepting our invitation and despite your busy schedule you are here with us today without further delay i know everyone is eagerly waiting to hear you sir i would now request uh, you to uh, just enlighten our participants with your talk over to you sir yeah thank you uh, shall i share the screen yes sir yeah um, am i visible my screen is visible yes sir you are perfectly audible and visible okay uh, thanks a lot for this kind words and i am really delighted to be uh, here it will be it is a, my pleasure to be a part of such celebration and i will try to uh, do honest um, that uh, or justice to my presentation and that with such a big words uh, uh, which came from the iqc coordinator that uh, you have you are doing a, such a wonderful job at your own premises that um, the main thing is that if we start uh, one little step or one baby step if everyone takes a one baby step it will we can walk down a mile so uh, it's a, uh, it doesn't matter that how uh, big or how small you start it's the most important thing is that we should start at some point of time so uh, not taking much time i will start my uh, talk um uh, i will mix hindi and english both uh, so it will be a little easier for all so right now i'm uh, i'm working as a scientist i am studied in delhi for almost 10 years and i completed my phd from jnu as uh, dr madhu has already told uh, there i was i also worked on waste management i worked on wazirpur i worked on balsawa i worked on uh, that um, uh, different uh, chatapur soils and uh, different areas and then i moved towards the coastal zone man management and then i did my phd in sundarban sundarban mangroves coastal wetlands coastal wetlands uh, wetlands uh, as you all know about the definition that uh, um, uh, i will not go into that that how the ramsar convention is defined def wetlands but uh, coming to the coastal wetland coastal wetlands that which are situated in the coast that is a uh, um, from the um, approximately 5 uh, um, uh, approximately 5 within the 5 km Uh, of the uh, shore line that is a high tide line from there to the land to the landward side or if we talk about the coast then the uh, salinity level should be 5 ppt or higher and that is the characteristics of a coastal wetland so uh, here we um, i am talking about two mainly uh, two type of coastal vegetations that is a mangrove and uh, seagrass as a as just uh, as the talk progresses so uh, may the source in the entire all whatever the data and whatever the statistics which i am uh, presenting in this the um, in this presentation is available online also one is the book by the ministry that is climate change <coughs> and vulnerable coast and second is the special volume of uh, ocean and coastal management uh, that is in uh, 2018 so overall the how the this talk is uh, oriented a uh, brief overview of how the coastal zone uh, coastal ecosystem and are interrelated with the climate change and then i will give a glimpse of mangrove of india and seagrass of india and what are the key messages they give in uh, in term of the climate change perspective or in climate change mitigation climate change we all know uh, is a um, uh, burning issue and uh, 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 the various uh, governmental and intergovernmental panels and then uh, cross country talks are going on that uh, with uh, um, changes a change in climate uh, there is a change in the precipitation pattern there is a change in uh, uh, average uh, atmospheric temperature there is change in the winter uh, winter which used to come at the month of november now it is slowly delaying to january so all these are thing the places where it doesn't used to rain it is raining very heavily and the places where it used to rain there is a drought and so this type of activity we read uh, 
daily uh, in newspaper um, various government uh, and inter various government agencies are working on it uh, which uh, including ours and then uh, the uh, carbon dioxide has permanently increased 400 ppm and it is highest in the last 10000 last 8000 years and it has resulted in the rise in the atmosphere pressure and then accordingly uh, mean sea level rise uh, result in the due to the melting of ice cap and this is well known issues which uh, every day some or other news is coming so we uh, how does we can uh, stop this is there a way to stop stop means mitigate there are two approaches to handle the climate change one is the adapt or either you adapt to it what are the changes are happening if the sea level is rising then you move to a higher level or uh, you mitigate it you stop the sea level change so um, adaptation is one thing and uh, here we are talking about the how to mitigate the impact of climate change using a natural natural ecosystem there are artificial ways also like there are geological carbon storage also and there are other ways also like um, uh, uh, using um, advancement in the fossil fuel consumption so that the carbon dioxide oxide emission is minimal or uh, changing of the cfc um, uh, chlorofluorocarbon with uh, some other freon uh, some other refreshing gas those are the other uh, technical uh, or artificial mitigation strategies but they how to we do the naturally naturally means that we uh, whatever the carbon dioxide though it is a slow process very slow process but uh, there is a way that um, uh, to uh, plant or to uh, develop and conserve uh, such a natural ecosystem which has very high carbon sequestration uh, capacity that means that uh, as the plant will grow it will take uh, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and that carbon dioxide will be transferred to your with biomass and will be removed from, from the atmosphere for our, for a longer period of time so coming to that yes uh, there are several like uh, there is uh, several forests are there forest are there all the trees sequester carbon all the uh, trees uh, capture carbon so what is special about it uh, so what is special about mangrove and seagrass uh, yes coastal wetlands uh, mangrove seagrass and salt marsh a uh, coastal vegetation um, uh, just uh, i came i jumped uh, before so the coastal wetland i already uh, discussed that the coastal wetland which are uh, uh, present in the coast there which are either estuaries which are either lagoons which are up, uh, either open water or uh, um, backwater up to a particular depth or a particular ppt in that different type of vegetation will grow either it will grow a mangroves or it will as seagrass or marsh species all these species are, co uh, are coastal vegetative species and they play an important role in global carbon sequestration you can ask why why these three are important there can be a name there can be a people there can be a banyan there can be anything else but yes when uh, uh, it is not that amount of the carbon which is stored by them it is the amount of carbon which is preserved by them for a time scale you have to compare the time scale in uh, terrestrial vegetation the time scale is shorter it will be preserved for thousands of year but in case of uh, coastal vegetation the time uh, scale is in millennia um the uh, if you think uh, from uh, chemical chemistry point of view uh, organic matter degradation is primarily an aerobic process uh, in uh, leaves fall and then you know big decomposition occurs and then uh, in uh, here in case of the coastal vegetation is primarily an anaerobic uh, decomposition and anaerobic decomposition is quite very very slow as compared to the aerobic decomposition so the biomass bio biomass removal is uh, degradation or release is slower as compared to the uh, terrestrial biomass and as apart from that uh, there is a fresh uh, sediment uh, inflow every time and then uh, the, the this sediment get deposited uh, uh, in layers and layers and go below and stored so globally uh, uh, the role of mangrove seagrass and salt marsh has been widely studied uh macloid in 2011 uh, um, assessed all, all the major ecosystems of uh, world and then he um, came out with the average rate and you can see that mangrove seagrass and so, uh, salt marshes are almost 10 to 20 time higher than temperate 
tropical and boreal um, uh, forest this with such a high uh, burial rate you can think of how ca- much their capability is to remove the atmospheric carbon and what uh, significant role they can play in mitigating climate change so uh, uh, again the uh, we can say the uh, from this uh, uh, that uh, this long term sequestration is much higher than terrestrial so seagrass can sequester up to 500 ton carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare uh, whereas estuarine and coastal mangrove can sequester up to 1800 ton carbon dioxide uh, equivalent per hectare uh, so uh, and uh, you, you from this example you can see how significant they are they they occupy less than 0.2% of the area of the world ocean seagrass but they contribute total more than 10% of the yearly organic carbon burial of the ocean so that you know, uh, that um, signifies that why they will be, this need to be conserved they need to be protected they need to be um, uh, restored i will come to seagrass uh, in a later uh, phase of the presentation so as a uh, server uh, talking that why we need to conserve and what is happening now uh, coastal vegetation uh, 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 up to last decades or up to a um, uh, couple of uh, years back like in uh, till 70 80s this vegetation this uh, were considered as a wasteland so um, coastal vegetation they were mainly cleared for the various uh, anthropogenic activities such as people used to clear for agriculture they used to clear for aquaculture with progress of science and with uh, these things or with the um, government uh, legislation these things has been restricted but still uh, there has been losses of uh, you know, around 22 uh, 5 to 50% of the global area in uh, last few decades and and still the annual loss is uh, from 0.5 to 3%. The, this loss is quite significant. 3% loss you can compare 3% loss of area you can compare with the per unit uh, carbon uh, dioxide uh, carbon uh, CO2 equivalent uh, uh, that uh, is uh, carbon sequestration capacity. So amount of car- carbon sequestration capacity which we are losing per area that is used. And in addition they provide a huge uh, ecosystem benefit like fishing fish uh, to fisheries to um, Uh, to honey forest products and other things but they uh, are uh, uh, despite of their resource they are being uh, losses are there so they are, uh, how, what type of losses either they are converted into aquaculture agriculture and over exploitation of forest resources like for timber or for thing or of these areas has been considered uh, converted for industrial and urban development apart from that if anyone have visited in uh, uh, mumbai thane mangrove stands an ex- excellent example where the ecosystem is under severe stress thane mangrove all the mumbai uh, seabeds or all these things uh, that area uh, if you see the soil soil is highly black in color and with a very high pungent that is characteristic methane and sulfide smell that indicates that high uh, labile that means the high degraded organic matter represent which is uh, negatively influencing this mangrove ecosystem also so that uh, those area the mangrove are stunted and then is, are in the states so these uh, places the action is urgently required to uh, stop the degradation and such losses so uh, uh, so uh, the now the uh, the slogan as which has come in the last couple of years is the blue is the new green so uh, land resources are limited ocean is one th- uh, two third of the earth surface globe surface so uh, we uh, we are looking at the ocean so blue is the new green so we um, uh, not only f- for this but uh, harvesting fisheries and other this seaweed and other resources so blue uh, emphasis is uh, more on more on um, on blue economy uh, how to transform the blue economy and in that the uh, carbon sequestration by coastal vegetation is an integral part of that blue economy so what has happened then uh, uh, around 10 years ago when we started this work we were given to uh, uh, to identify and uh, delineate the amount of carbon sequestered by this car, um, uh, this uh, mangrove and sequestration 
Sigra ecosystem. At the same time, it was also told that, as you are all aware, that when we talk, one of the characteristics uh, of a wetland ecosystem is uh, greenhouse gas emission. Due to this anaerobic environment, uh, the uh, organic matter uh, degraded. Uh, degrades and it also converts into the methane methane which methane is uh, uh, an addition to co2 this methane is also emitted so both co2 and methane are greenhouse gases so um, they effectively releases the greenhouse gases so uh, our task was to uh, uh, delineate their role whether there are net emitter net gag emission fluxes are there or net positive flux or it is a net uh, sequester if it is uh, sequestering carbon then how much it is the sequestering carbon what is the global role so first we as a first and foremost task we started we uh, took uh, literature uh, whatever type of literature wherever it was published uh, throughout coast, coast of india we took and then we found that it was very difficult to rationalize the data set because they used uh, diverse methodology uh, one university university was using another methodology another university was using another methodology it was the results were difficult to compare there was no uniformity in uh, the area somewhere is saying that it's a uh, 500 uh, 5000 square kilometer somewhere is saying 6500 so to overcome uh, these things we started with a uh, uniform methodology we first mapped the entire all the blue coastal vegetative ecosystem seagrass mangrove and sea, and then we with the uh, common methodology we uh, measured this gjg emission and uh, carbon uh, carbon content and carbon burial in this ecosystem to arrive a, a common data set or uniform data set which was communicated to ministry and then unf triple c so coming to this uh, distribution of this coastal wetlands that is the first way i talk about mangrove the mangroves uh, as you know in the uh, uh, grow mainly in the estuarine environment or uh, in Ireland also they grow uh, so uh, it's uh, West Bengal in Ganges Delta, Bithakanika and Mahanadi Mangrove, Koringa Mangrove in Godavari Delta, Pichavaram and Mutupet in Kaveri uh, Delta, Kannur uh, Kum Kumta and Kar uh, Karwadi in Karnataka in uh, Kali and Nansni, Goa if you have gone then uh, Mandvi and Juwari River have very good mangrove in Thane and Ratnagiri again the, their good uh, mangroves are there Gulf of Kutch, uh, huge plantation and then Carfocanses has seen tremendous growth in mangrove. So uh, just to give a glimpse that uh, the uh, 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 mangroves in India is very diverse and up to uh, like in Bithakanika up to uh, 35 type of mangrove species and in Mandaban 38 type of mangrove species has been observed. And uh, um, while, uh, uh, as I uh, told that we uh, took uh, that CO2 fluxes and then methane fluxes, these things, and then pan India, we saw that uh, wherever the disturbance uh, was there, or uh, the those area emitted more. And apart from that, uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, mangrove, uh, West Bengal, shrine mangrove, where the sea fresh water dominance was also less, so the, but the area was more more so those yeah, those area when the as a whole the area was uh, consolidated at the time these uh, states contributed more in not only the co2 fluxes but methane fluxes but these fluxes were very less so and uh, then we try to um, calculate the net primary products uh, products and that is how much co2 it's a, it is uptaking per hectare Per hectare, that's higher the productivity, better uh, the sequestration, the more CO2 it will take and more it will go into the vegetation and then it will go uh, into the uh, into uh, uh, the uh, into this uh, biomass. So, and then mangrove of East Coast, the uh, carbon CO2 uptake was varied from uh, 3.26 megagram carbon per hectare to 35.44 um, megagram per hectare. Such a high variation, you are approximately 10 time variations were observed. It the variation in, were entirely dependent on the local topography, type of uh, freshwater, type of uh, salinity, and uh, type uh, and uh, anthropogenic stress, and everything. There were several factors which played in this thing, but on an average, it varied from 3.2 to 35. Uh, 
Pichavaram, uh, Pich for a take example that Pichavaram, Pichavaram uptake was highest uh, that 28 megagram carbon per hectare and they usually Heritaria, Exocoria and Avicinia Marina, these were highest uh, associated with highest carbon dioxide uptake, right? These, uh, you all are a student of, um, you all are from the Department of Botany and you know very well about these uh, uh, mangrove trees. Uh, so, and compared to East Coast, mangrove West uh, Coast were patchy. So uh, and patchy and uh, less diverse and uh, uh, as uh, as you know the mangrove uh, the slope of India is from west coast to east coast so all the major rivers are flowing from east coast to uh, eastern uh, western side uh, from uh, to the eastern side take it any major river so uh, uh, hence the western coast the flow uh, discharge is high discharge is high so there is a less settling time for sediment and uh, so uh, deltas are not observed in the west coast as a result mangroves are also, also wet patchy because they need a substrata to grow so uh, consequently mangroves were less patchy and uh, less species generation uh, was there so carbon uptake rate was also uh, observed lower and um, f then we calculated how much is the coming in the biomass with the allometric request uh, 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 equation and then from the tree we calculated tree density for example uh, in case of sundarvan it was um, 6. Uh, up to it was high as uh, 6.5 megagram carbon hectare per year uh, this much was annual carbon dioxide as a biomass and highest carbon sequestration rate were observed in as a biomass in south gujarat where it was um, uh, 180 uh, 180 megagram hectare per, uh, per, per hectare that is a uh, in south uh, observe and the maximum uh, throughout india if you say uh, throughout india uh, the mangroves of um, uh, 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 mangroves were the taller and um, uh, stronger and uh, most most luxuriant growth of mangrove was in andaman and, and nicobar island and the carbon stocks was also the highest in entire india uh, then we calculated that how much the carbon stock is there in the sediment. Uh, sediment for we calculated bulk density, bulk density, and then uh, with the uh, um, entire e area we multiplied, um, and, the, and then per, uh, whole uh, this we and like in uh, Sundarvan the area was the max highest uh, area, and then the car accordingly carbon stocks was also high that around eight around nine thousand gigagram of carbon was uh, uh, sediment organic carbon was present in the Indian mangrove, uh, whereas in case of Gujarat, uh, it uh, was 7,700 uh, uh, 7, gigagram. Of Here you will notice in case where Mumbai is there, the carbon stock is very high. The Thane patch is very less, but the carbon stock is may very high. As we uh, we were quite uh, little, uh, quite uh, uh, surprised, but then we correlated with uh, other factors. Other factors that um, per hectare the carbon stock of Ma Maharashtra is very high. Why? Then uh, uh, when we see the local condition that uh, and uh, uh, in lab analysis uh, when we carried out much of this carbon stock was transient. Transient means uh, that it was very short lived, and as soon as it entered into the system. It was a uh, uh, was attacked by the microbes, or uh, due to changes in physiochemical, uh, then GAG release was there, or uh, it was uh, leased out in the sediment. So uh, mainly, it is it was due to the anthropogenic condition, or that sewage what is coming, or sewage based uh, that organic matter which is coming, it is being the deposit in the mangrove roots, and as a result, the SOC stock was uh, very high. So while computing the average uh, stock, we have taken uh, consider as, a, as an overlap because this does not uh, represent the true sequestration capacity of uh, mangrove. Now I will come to, uh, uh, I've given a pan-India picture of uh, how the carbon stock and uh, how are they uh, behaving in uh, various ecosystems. Now I will go to the seagrass ecosystem. Seagrass ecosystem are very less studied in India. One of the reasons is that very difficult to study. Mangrove is comparatively easy to study. They are above ground and then you can easily access them. And seagrass is a little tricky because they are underwater. You need to have a, uh, you need to uh, know diving that uh, how uh, to uh, 
collect sample and do research and then uh, you need a sophisticated in- instrument for like underwater core underwater sampler or a bo- through boat and it's uh, the research is also a little expensive so uh, m- uh, most of the uh, uh, so it's not as popular as bangrose but still uh, studies has been coming up and they, they are various institute which are focusing uh, uh, um, particularly uh, on seagrass itself so seagrass is just like um, seagrass and angel sperm they are flowering plant they live entirely underwater higher the salinity uh, more is the growth so they uh, they have a very vital role they vital role they are called as uh, lungs of water lungs of water that they take co2 and then uh, since they are uh, angiosperm and they have high chlorophyll content they take co2 and make the water column very healthy by uh, releasing the oxygen into the water column that as a result so when the water is oxygen oxygenated uh, and wa- water is healthy you can think of that fishes and other things which uh, requires oxygen they will grow and higher the productivity so uh, and uh, apart from that they Uh, the top uh, 50 cm or 100 cm which is a root zone leaf leaf is often grazed by the turtle and uh, uh, the fishes but it's a root which mainly store the carbon and root is uh, percent whatever the carbon which is stored in the root or buried in the sediment it goes into the longer uh, time scale and it is not released back immediately uh, common is seagrass species uh, which are present in the uh, halophila uh, syringodium and thalassia Uh, and a uh, quite interesting thing is that uh, this seagrass uh the pip we know uh, uh, people also know but uh, for the local community many of the local community they consider as a waste land even though they are underwater and they don't require, but when a fisherman is going to the ship to see through its boat and it's flowing uh, over the seagrass if the water depth is shallow or uh, during low tide time uh, in the por- propeller of the boat these leaves get stuck and which causes damage to this do uh, damage to his boat so uh, quite often these are uh, uh, considered as a negative uh, factor for the fishing community and they do uh, take it as a wasteland and uh, but uh, slowly the, uh, with the community awareness and with uh, these things how the it is important for if you remove seagrass your fishes will not be there and why uh, how you will go for fishing and for what we will go for fishing the fishes are not there so slowly this type of um, that um, uh, interactive program and then community re- outreach is going on to make them understand what is the significance and how they play an important role for your uh, fish productivity and other things and uh, now coming what uh, um what um uh causes uh, what co- how the seagrass is distributed uh it has to be a temperature salinity salinity wave and depth salinity wave and current current means they need a calm comparatively calm area for a calm area means they uh, the calm area will help them to hold the substratum that uh, that a bed sediment or bed soil and then they will and the higher the daylight if the daylight is more than photosynthesis wave they will uh, be able to do and they need a moderate amount of nutrient if uh, um, uh, as you all from department botany you know there is a competition when the nutrient is there uh, when the nutrient uh, 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 come uh, uh, amount of nutrient is there then a limited uh, productivity is limited productivity is limited those uh, those uh, plant which have a good chlorophyll or uh, they can uh, make more production so uh, in that case this type of angiosperm will be when nutrient is in excess slowly algal glow growth will be uh, um, that slowly they are from diatom to dinoflagellate growth will be and they will take consume and the, uh, accordingly the, they will block the seal uh, light and the, when the excess of nutrient is there when two excess then uh, is there then uh, uh, it will be dominated by this uh, Uh, by the um, uh, dinoflagellate and the uh, harmful algal growth will be there which is again a um, uh, negative factor for the fisheries and other things but at the same time these seagrass ecosystem uh, they act as a lungs lungs again uh, the concept lungs they not only gives the oxygen but they also if any slight excess nutrient is there they will uptake and they will transfer their leaf and these things and then they will uh, 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 somehow they act as a buffer 
avoiding the eutrophication of the coastal uh, process. So, in uh, where the, there is a slight variation in the nutrient concentration, they act as a buffer. However, if a drastic changes are there, if you make a sewage outfall or an industrial outfall, then uh, the cases are different. So, uh, they uh, play an important role. Uh, they act as a natural sea defense by trapping uh, sediments, yes. They act as a nursery ground for commercial fishes, carbon sequestration, oxygen, produces oxygen. They promote biological productivity, improve water quality, uh, etc. Uh, this I will just uh, remove uh, tell from uh, um, not talk about this uh, as of now. Uh, later I will come. So coming to um, uh, or just quickly, the, if, uh, example if we uh, uh, here uh, now I will just uh, here if we see if a uh, seagrass is healthy, seagrass is healthy that means higher CO2. Uh, left side you can see the seagrass is high uh, healthy is higher CO higher O2 the ambient water high carbon burial and increased calcification rate of the coral that means coral also healthy but when the seagrass is stressed then the photosynthesis activity is there less oxygen pumping is there more CO2 pumping is there less organic less carbon burial and then the increased DI, uh, DIC flux uh, dissolve uh, in our carbon that means that uh, uh, water acidity will be also increased that means that calcification rate also will decrease as a result it is a negative impact on the corals so uh, now talking about that uh, are there coastal wetlands in uh, india which have a uh, uh, seagrass ecosystem yes there are many park bay park bay is has the highest see seagrass cover park bay is near rameswaram if you have a pen to go to rameswaram sometime there is a place called devi patnam uh, from devi patnam devi patnam is the place where uh, lord rama or sri rama uh, that um, uh, uh, before st uh, starting the war or going to the war he did uh, puja and uh, offered his uh, devi puja and offered his uh, eye uh, that uh, um, uh, um, uh, offered uh, for uh, to the god for support and they, they, that place they hire take boat and that is an area full with uh, devi um, sea grasses and there they do with glass bottom boat they do boating for to see the, how the sea grass are um, uh, correlated uh, present there with uh, uh, coral ecosystem uh, with glass Last bottom boat they will take you into the open ocean uh, the uh, not ocean actually in the bay where uh, you can see uh, water is slowly from uh, at a uh, uh, all of a sudden water will become crystal clear like you are seeing a glass full of water it's a crystal clear and you can see the bottom uh, that three to four meter depth and then uh, you can see the sea uh, 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 grasses waving and uh, in, like in uh, uh, the way uh, the plants wave in the when there is a wind or something the very beautiful and then in fishes and uh, corals you can see uh, swimming there from the glass bottom of. and so it has the largest uh, 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 seagrass ecosystem and as much as 14 seagrass species are present then uh, besides that um, uh, that uh, um, Gulf of Panar it has a 85 square kilometer that also has a very beautiful seagrass and coral ecosystem then comes the Chilka Lagoon Chilka Lagoon is uh, situated in Odisha it's a uh, quite a big lagoon that uh, it it has a around 85 square kilometer of uh, seagrass area. And then luxury Pandamanikwa Island, Gulf of Kutch, total of around 350 square kilometer of uh, seagrass area is present. So uh, I will be talking here may, uh, with respect to two main eco two ecosystem. One is Silica and well, Park Bay. Here, whatever the rate patches here uh, are there, uh, these uh, uh, this um, on this uh, lagoon um, that uh, rate patches entirely in indicates the seagrass that is located in this other. You going? Uh, uh, the, uh, that uh, located in the southern part of that uh, uh, Chilika Lagoon. Uh, it is in Odisha. Uh, it is again a very beautiful touristic place. Uh, Park Bay. Park Bay is all along the coast of Park Bay. Um, uh, all along the coast of Park Bay from northern Park Bay to southern Park Bay. That is a near. Uh, this is here. The Pamban Bridge, Pamban Bridge is there. Where the below southern post. Uh, that uh, the seagrass is there. Dense, sparse, medium, dense, and very dense. All type of the we uh, whenever we surveyed, we mapped them accordingly. So uh, we uh, uh, we checked that how much CO2 they are emitting. Uh, 
that uh, CO2 uh, equivalent uh, uh, 13 and uh, 19 CO, um, uh, CO2 equivalent uh, gigagram of CO2 equivalent per year uh, equating that uh, it was for the entire area. So when we compare this with mangrove, you can see the mangrove and serious net emission is uh, the, from seagrass is 16, whereas in case of mangrove is uh, 511. So seagrass more, uh, is having a more underwater, more anoxic environment as compared to mangrove and comparatively uh, lesser anthropogenic stress as compared to mangroves. So we also calculated the water color column productivity versus the seagrass productivity and the red line, uh, red line, uh, uh, straight straight line indicates the water line uh, respiration and the blue lines indicates the water column productivity. Wa uh, water column. And then uh, this um, uh, bars indicates the productivity of this species. Uh, that different. You can clearly see see that respiration is always lower than the uh, productivity, and then uh, in case of all these um, all this ecosystem. Uh, all this ecosystem, the uh, um, uh, the grow, uh, net productivity is always higher, always higher than water column productivity, which indicates that this ecosystem is very very highly productive, and the water product productivity is much higher than the phytoplankton productivity. Usually they say the seawater product, sea, uh, ocean productivity is mainly contributed from the phytoplankton productivity but these results also show that uh, seagrass also contributes significantly in the phytoplankton productivity. We also calculated the phytoplankton productivity separately uh, in, the, uh, in the adjoining area where there was no seagrass ecosystem and in those areas where was seagrass ecosystem and then you can see uh, just a minute my battery is down i will just uh, plug in yeah uh, in this uh, this area where the uh, so, and uh, clearly we can uh, we observe that everywhere the seagrass productivity was much much higher around 20 uh, at least 20 times higher than the phytoplankton productivity and then uh, overall we uh, chilika chilika um, i will just go to this uh, slide chilika th uh, is a very beautiful ecosystem like in northern part uh, i hope you are see uh, able to see the markers are moving right in the northern part uh, the um, uh, see uh, this area we get the fresh water discharge and southern area southern part there is a very less fresh water discharge or there is this very seasonal fresh water discharge, and it's more or less stable environment this is a uh, uh, dominated by the macrophyte, whereas this area, southern area, is dominated by the uh, seagrass ecosystem. So there is a clear distinction uh, uh, that uh, macrophyte dominated area in the northern part, in the central part, uh, 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 there is a no vegetation is there. Whereas in the southern part, it's mainly the seagrass ecosystem. It's, it's a very clear cut vegetative dom uh, uh, the vegetative uh, uh, demarcation is there. So when we see in the northern part, here we is, uh, we calculated the net ecosystem metabolism. Net to ecosystem metabolism is nothing but the difference between the uh, photosynthesis and respiration. So we calculated the net ecosystem uh, uh, metabolism for the entire chilika. Northern sector, the first one where it is uh, dominated with the macrophyte, uh, central sector and outer channel. Uh, central sector is a uh, there is no vegetation is present or very less vegetation is present. Outer channel there is a small channel which connects to the um, uh, sea. Uh, that is a, here the mainly seawater dominance in sea, uh, southern sector where the seagrass is present. Uh, so you can see except for the southern sector where the seagrass is present, everywhere uh, respiration dominated over the photosynthesis. Respiration dominated over the photosynthesis that means that there is the, the net ecosystem metabolism was negative whereas uh, in case of southern sector uh, net ecosystem metabolism was more or less positive 
positive this means that in this area that during dry season high carbon sequestration or high there is a higher uptake of co2 which is being converted into biomass and then it is uh, buried underground so then uh, we, uh, uh, during our study we also observed various type of vegetation serous vegetation and then it was understood that uh, it was clear with from the literature and other things that it is a root which mainly stores the seagrass uh, biomass so uh, seagrass uh, biomass and uh, it, uh, the carbon is stored for a longer period of time so we took various uh, vegetation and then we calculated roots to today so it was always more than one and then uh, uh, one indicates that a uh, root biomass is more denser than the leaf biomass so and higher the biomass uh, higher the carbon sequestration capacity of that particular area a particular species so and then uh, we took um, the, uh, in uh, with a specialized webu core uh, instrument we took the sediment core and up to 90 cm we take took and then uh, clearly you can see as we go down uh, from 10 to 30 cm there is a drastic decrease in the soil carbon content and after 30 cm it's more or less uniform uniform that is more or less follow the steady pattern that is a upper 30 it is upper 30 meter centimeter where most of the microbial activity whether it's aerobic or anaerobic uh, uh, occurs and after 30 uh, centimeter uh, the, these are the active zone for the carbon sequestration and these uh, these are the you can say the older sediment and an upper one is the newer sediment and as the sediment are deposited these uh, slowly these uh, new sediment layer will come and then slowly the upper will uh, come and bury and then slowly it will the carbon burial will take place and uh, the, based on that we uh, calculated the uh, entire silica um, in case of uh, uh, silica ecosystem we calculated the carbon budget that how much is the budget so approximately we uh, saw that uh, around 0.08 teragram carbon per year is lost by respiration however net and this is net uh, carbon burial is 0.6 0.06 teragram per carbon per year and sediment has 0.6 uh, 0.76 teragram carbon per year as a stock so whereas uh, in case of park bay uh, the area is uh, high and uh, uh, here the fresh water problem is not so much salinity is high so uh, production is also high and uh, respiration is comparatively lesser than the uh, production and the sediment has to around 2.5 teragram carbon per year so throughout india if we uh, calculate for all the entire area india how much is there being stored and how much there is there uh, that uh, uh, sediment storage is there around 100 to 150 megagram organic carbon per hectare whereas below mass uh, ground below below ground biomass um, contribute around 3 megagram uh, carbon per hectare and gross primary productivity as the size of arrow indicates is much higher than the respiration and burial net organic carbon burial is around 1.0 up to uh, 1.6 megagram carbon per hectare per year so overall what we uh, summarize that how this coastal ecosystem will help in mitigating the blue car uh, car uh, blue mitigating the impact of climate change uh, so uh, ipcc also has uh, indicated that despite of annual uh, global losses uh, that uh, sea grasses at 7% mangrove 0.7 to 3% salt marshes 1 to 2% these as act as a major source for global barring uh, carbon burial so um, when we compare Uh, different type of coast uh, different type of terrestrial vegetation uh, which is present in india with respect to our coastal vegetation coastal vegetation uh, and all india average so you can see the coastal peninsular region is somehow clear by various coastal vegetation uh, the net uh, net carbon stock even though the area is very less very less as compared to the whole terrestrial forest uh, you can see their uh, net carbon burial per gigagram per is very much comparable uh, with respect to the indian average
So, uh, yeah, as you all are aware of the India's INDC, uh, that um, uh, of, uh, our um, place five says that to create additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion ton of CO2 equivalent through additional forest cover by 2030. So, uh, uh, where does we stand? So, our results says that if we uh, uh, carbon uh, net carbon burial or net carbon removal per hectare per year is uh, for mangrove is 1.7 megagram, whereas uh, for seagrass is 1.66 megagram. So, uh, if we uh, increase 20 percent of the area cover, so how much uh, carbon we, we, we can increase? So, net carbon per year, if we increase that per year, we can add around 700 gigagram of uh, carbon per. Uh, man, uh, per uh, um, uh, uh, 700 gigagram of carbon for mango, whereas in case of seagrass, we can add up to 85 gigagram of carbon. Here, the biomass also rose, plays a role. Uh, mango biomass is more as compared to seagrass biomass. And if we restore 100 hectare of stress or degraded ecosystem, that will reduce the carbon dioxide emission uh, by 144 gigagram for mango ecosystem, whereas for seagrass, 52 gigagram of mango system so uh, uh, this for a policy maker or for uh, um, this one uh, non from non science background we also um, simplified it that uh, uh, if we um, uh, uh, protect or if we restore one acre of seagrass ecosystem it was more simplified uh, uh, in language we said that it can sequester uh, 3350 gram or kg of uh, kg of carbon per year as just in a simplified or it can mitigate carbon dioxide emission from a car traveling 6200 kilometer or it can um, absorb 2.9 kg of nutrient which is coming from the effluent from 490 people and it can provide an ecosystem services worth 11 lakh ecosystem services means uh, the provisional services, conditioning services like uh, honey, fish, uh, shoreline protection, everything that is up to 11 lakh, uh, rupees 11 lakh per year. So, uh, yeah, acknowledgement. Thank you. Any questions are there? I will be very happy to take it. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah. A very good afternoon to all present here. Thank you so much, sir, for delivering such an informative talk on World's Wetland Day. It's indeed a pleasure to hear from you on this day. Uh, yes, looking at the inquisitiveness of our students, we have got a uh, few questions. With your due permission, sir, can I ask? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, before taking up questions, I would now request the participants to fill the feedback form which has already been floated in the chat box. So uh, question one is from, uh, the first question is, what are the main consideration that affects the success of a wetland restoration? Um, uh, apart from the science part, uh, science is one thing. Apart from that, uh, what uh, mostly that uh, impacts uh, the success of a, a wetland restoration is the community participation. Unless and until a community participates in the re restoration, they do not take the ownership. The uh, uh, the restoration will not be successful. It will come to back to again the stress environment. The moment the government protection or that uh, is over, this way. So community involvement, community. The, there is a concept called CBM, community-based management. For the uh, that has to be there, uh, and they has to be involved in each and every stage, making in an aware that why the wetland is important for you. If we restore, how it is going to be helpful for you, and so it is the most important thing. Without com uh, involving community, we cannot do anything. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is why do sea grasses like shallow waters? Yes, uh, seagrass is again an angiosperm and which has chlorophyll in it. And then they do need um, uh, sunlight. Uh, wherever the, till the area, the sunlight penetrates. And then sea also, there is a particular level where the seagrass, where the sunlight penetrates. And after that, it's a darker. Up to that level, the seagrass has been observed in various parts of the world. And then uh, 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 the area where the uh, sunlight is limited, uh, uh, then um, uh, the, they don't prefer to. Grow. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, 
I think this was the same question I was also framing in my mind. But one of our student has asked, wetlands are mostly connected with Ramsar conventions. So what are these Ramsar conventions and how can we identify them? Uh, Ramsar Convention. Ramsar Convention is nothing. Ramsar Convention is a convention which uh, there is a treaty or you can say there is a understanding which has been uh, formed with, among the different country uh, countries in Ramsar, Iran, and it was a um, uh, defined code of conduct for the each country who is a signatory and they have to follow these things, and each country has to come up with their list of a um, uh, uh, list of wetland, uh, um, wait, uh, Indian wetlands. Uh, just a minute, I'm typing one thing. Yeah, yeah. Dot in. Um, uh, in this, each of the can each of the um, uh, country has to, uh, the signatory country has to come up with the list of wetland which qualify on the Ramsar Ram scale or they have a potential uh, 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 to become a Ramsar wetland. Then uh, they give a set of guidelines. Then based on this, they have to take the restoration activity, conservation activity, protection activity, and based on the guideline, the uh, concern the wetland authority will submit a report and then what under the ones over Ramsar convention. And these are notified and the grant is received to for the protection and management of the institute so management of the uh, that particular um, uh, wetland so it's uh, entirely like india is a signatory to ramsar and as far as india has an india has 49 uh, ramsar uh, ramsar wetlands there are more than 1000 wetlands in india uh, uh, more than thousands because the uh, wetland you can qu quantify any uh, standing water pool as a wetland <laughs> so uh, there but um, there are certain things are there that which they have narrowed down like uh, um, they have excluded right now for this um, uh, conservation point of view that uh, even though rice, uh, the rice or paddy fields are also a wetland crop but they have been excluded mm -hmm. from a conservation point of view so um, uh, uh, so based on that uh, the uh, this uh, India wetlands dot in I will request everyone to look at it now uh, our institute is also given the task of uh, um, uh, this uh, conserving and maintaining the, all the Indian wetlands, and we have come up with this wetland uh, with this website, which has information of uh, of all the Indian wetlands, whether it's a Ramsar or whether it's a non-Ramsar, and slowly all the uh, all the states which are going for the Ramsar uh, Ramsar wetlands, they all details are being uploaded here, and all the information you will get it here. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question is, are there more plants other than sweet grasses which act as carbon sinks in the aquatic ecosystem? Uh, carbon sinks, yes. Uh, they are, uh, carbon sinks, uh, um, actually, if you talk about carbon sinks, all the plants act as a carbon sink. Uh, the question here we ask about that, how long? Corals, yes, coral also do act as a carbon sink. Uh, there is a giant clamp, are there? There are other things, uh, seaweeds are there. Right, right now, uh, there is also studies going on that uh, whether the seaweed can be act as a carbon sequester, and carbon sequester, even not in the longer time scale. It's uh, here we are talking when we talk about the carbon sequester, and we talk about the scale that to how long it is going to be sequestered. Um, uh, a co common plant which you grow. Uh, that also will act as a carbon sink because it will uh, capture carbon from the atmosphere and it will help it to grow. And that carbon is transferred from the atmospheric to uh, that is a um, uh, um, that uh, air or gases form to non gases form, non as a biomass. Uh, as a biomass, either it is, uh, uh, the, uh, for example, if you take about a uh, dhania, uh, just simplest example, the dhania, if you plant a seed of dhania, it will grow, it will grow to a plant, it will use oxygen and carbon. And and other things from the atmosphere and soil to make it body I and mean, they make it cell growth and you will con uh, it you will grow it right um, the certain suppose five gram of carbon is uh, has come in 100 gram of um, 100 gram of dhania that will be consumed by a person it will come to a human bi biomass so slowly that uh, transfer will be there but uh, the one particular amount of carbon has been removed but at what time scale it is removed that is important that is reported that uh, uh, say talks about the long-term carbon sequestration. When we talk about the mitigation uh, mitigation option, we talk about long-term carbon sequestration. So in uh, case of seagrass, uh, in case of the coast, there is uh, mainly it's, uh, salt marshes and the seagrass ecosystem. Salt marshes were in the boundary border. There, there is a high, uh, high uh, hypersaline water is there, uh, whereas seagrass uh, underwater and mangroves on the shore. 
uh, di uh, sekitar Jakarta. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, do wetlands have high biomass? Yes, why, why, mala, the question is a little, uh, mala, that she wanted to say that why do mangrove, why do wetland plants have a biomass? Mm. Wetlands are usually, uh, wetlands are usually associated with, uh, uh, actually, um, uh, these wetlands, they have been seen as a, uh, you can see a point of uh, economic growth. Economic growth, <coughs> if you take about any wetland, in wetland, let's say inland wetland, inland wetland also, if you see Sultan for example i will see sultan historically it has been uh, considered as a, uh, it was uh, very useful uh, area for the local community for fisheries right so when uh, so uh, i'm just taking a, in a layman's language that if uh, fishery. so if a, uh, if a area is considered as a um, uh, useful resource for the local community they will try to settle in and around there so all these wetlands will have in and around settlements whether it's talk about this uh, chilika or other things this settlement when there is a settlement there is a nutrient release also is there nutrient release is there if the nutrient release is there the productivity will also be high it's a vice versa thing so when productivity will high if the nutrient release is more then productivity will, will decrease due to the algal bloom so it's a very fine or uh, very tricky situation so as a result uh, since the wetlands uh, are uh, considered as a nutrient source or uh, nutrient uh, compatibly nutrient uh, recycling is high in wetlands so uh, whatever the plant or vegetation is uh, growing is uh, uh, luxuriant or has a good uh, 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 biomass in that Thank you, sir. Uh, can I compare the trend of hydrometeorological variables with wetland degradation in some region? Yes, uh, you can. Uh, you can. Uh, hydrometeorological, uh, it means that if there is an erosion. Uh, um, hydro, uh, um, meteorological means that uh, it's related to air, whereas hydrological is related to water. Uh, air, uh, you, um, with respect to air, if there is, uh, they, uh, in case of coastal wetland, if you can say, they actually act as a barrier. If, uh, if you read about uh, tsunami or something uh, that uh, they uh, has acted as, a, uh, again, or whether it's a cyclone, they have acted as a barrier. So, but uh, in case of degradation, yes, the hydrological factor is an important thing. Uh, not meteorological, but hydrology. Hydrology, hydrology is important. Hydrology is important. For example, I can see uh, Sundarvan, you know, and you know about the how the name Sundarvan has come. Sundarvan name has come from the tree Sundari, Hereditia formus, right? Uh, so, Sundari is uh, where uh, when the sun used to shine on that tree, it used to glitter as a silver very silver sign, uh, sign. so uh, now there is uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, human influences or anything slowly if you see the map carefully all the indian rivers except for in indian sundar part of the sundar one except for the gang hugli which is coming toward the Cal uh, from the calcutta all the other rivers whether it's matla whether it's muriganga or other things they have lot, uh, lost connection from the freshwater source there is no freshwater coming except for the hugli which goes from the eastern side of the much beyond from the uh, uh, exactly sundar one so as a result the salinity uh, whatever the mangroves uh, in indian's part of the sundar one is uh, mostly uh, dominated by the saline water that what are the river are there they are saline so uh, there is there was a hydrological changes as a result uh, the fresh water influence has re reduced and the saline water influence this has resulted in the Decline of uh, hereditary vegetation in uh, Indian Sundarvan. As a result, Sundari in uh, Indian Sundarvan has vanished. Whereas in Bangladesh, where it, there is a plenty of fresh water is coming, is flourishing like anything. Right. So uh, hydrometeorology is plays a very important role in mangrove, or in case of uh, seagrass, or in case of salt mass, anything is uh, hydrometeorology is important. Uh, I think uh, this is somewhat related to what I have previously asked you. What are the evidences of climate change affecting wetlands and which type of wetland faces the largest loss? Uh, what are the evidences of climate change affecting the wetland and what type of wetland affect the largest loss? Largest loss. Uh, yes, uh, you can just see the clim uh, climate change. Uh, climate change, that there, what is the cascading impact of climate change? 
if there is a climate change there there is a change in rainfall pattern there is a change in precipitation pattern there is change in the solar energy right is that there is a more uh, more heat will be there less rainfall will be there if more heat is there less rainfall is there obviously the water uh, rate of evaporation will be high and rate of uh, um, recharge of that wetland will be low and as a result uh, when the uh, as a result the net area shrinkage will be there so uh, earlier whatever the wetland if you see historically all the indian wetlands whatever their spread was there they are slowly shrinking shrinking due to the change in the rainfall pattern and change in the Uh, solar irradiation so as a result there is a different definitely uh, losses and uh, it's uh, difficult to say that for me to which has the largest loss but yes more or less every wetland is having a significant yeah, negative no. impact due to the cost yes sir uh, thank you sir uh, just few more questions yes sure, are sure. there more plants other than sea grasses which act as carbon sinks in the aquatic ecosystem I say, um, uh, that carbon sink. Yes, I told now uh, that all, uh, all almost the all the plants plant will say uh, will sink, but it's all it's the scale which matters, okay. right? Uh, so mainly three three groups are considered as a long term that mangrove, seagrass, and salt marsh. These are the three groups which sequester carbon and on a geological long uh, scale. So could you please re- repeat that mangroves, salt, sea seagrass, and uh-huh. salt marshes? Okay. Thank you, sir. Mangroves, example, Rhizophora avicennia, Heritaria. Yeah. Salt marsh, example, is um, uh, Sweda, Sweda maritima, mm-hmm. and uh, Seagrass, a Halidule. I remember the same kind of research. It was going on. It was a project from uh, environmental uh, uh, forest department, and uh, it was being taken up by one of my senior, Avi Sena and Heri Shiera. Okay. Okay. So I had a pretty uh, good amount of knowledge on these two plants, the okay. mangroves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, one question is from uh, the coordinator: How can our students at undergraduate level participate and contribute towards coast plan conservation? Uh, coastal and conservation. Yes. Uh, first thing is that under uh, if they if they belong to coastal community. Uh, if they belong to coastal community or they come from the coast then they should make them they uh, uh, locally aware what is the role yeah. what uh, how this is that is the most important thing that they can contribute apart from that they can also contribute uh, uh, by coming up in uh, r&d activity or research activities so uh, so that they can more uh, contribute more to the knowledge and these things mm, i do agree with that so and uh, we are, and uh, for your information at uh, nccm here we do take uh, internship for like summer internship okay. if someone wants to, to do then they can always contact our director with their short cv and what they want to work and how, how they are. it has to be related to the course that is only thing uh, there and then we have a diverse that starting from microbiology to uh, chemistry to physics to modeling everything all are in one platform that anyone can contact uh, for their internship or like a uh, 6 months or uh, um, yeah, one year if uh, he or she wants to carry on okay just one last question sir sure. um, are there any drawbacks to plant a seagrass no as such there is no drawback the drawback in the sense that uh, first of all first thing is that there is a plantation uh, it's a uh, plantation activity is a little tricky as uh, mm-hmm. plantation is not there because it's an underwater underwater plantation is difficult it's best ways to leave it uh, as such then it will re- rejuvenate and regrow by itself but even though their plantation exercises are being uh, they are doing there is no as such impact they uh, they are very healthy and very beneficial for the coastal not only for this one but uh, coastal like uh, uh, they act as a food for me sea turtle olive little turtle they love to eat seagrass mm. uh, uh, coastal uh, community i told uh, you know the coastal community sometime they because they uh, interfere with their daily activity they consider them as a waste land otherwise ecologically they are very important ecosystems oh thank you sir and, and you are planting it under water so it doesn't yeah. matter right <laughs> Uh, so, with your due permission, can I ask the students, our students, to contact you on your mail for further queries? Sure, 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 sure. Uh-huh. You can share my mail number, no problem. Yeah, thank you, sir. That's so kind of you. Okay, 
moving forward i would like to thank you uh, sir for answering all of the questions such as factory and so patiently uh, just meeting up all of our students question thank you sir i on behalf of entire botany department deshbandhu college once again would like to thank you for cordially accepting our invitation and delivering the talk on world's wetland day we all hope to listen from you again very soon sure 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 I, it will be my pleasure yeah thank you so much sir now i would request dr preeti to kindly proceed with the event further over to you preeti ma'am thank you neha ma'am thank you so much uh thank you very much sir for your enlightening and insightful talk on coastal wetland and climate change it was indeed a pleasure to listen to you uh we sincerely appreciate you uh, for taking time out from your busy schedule to provide us with such valuable information so we have a small token of appreciation for you in the form of an appreciation certificate and a memento please accept them with our sincere thanks i would now uh, request muskan to display the certificate of appreciation and memento on the screen thank you thanks a lot thank you muskan now on the occasion of world wetland day an inter college paper reading contest was organized today in the morning session of this event topic for the competition was wetland conservation and the contest was open for undergraduate students and various students from different colleges of delhi university actively participated in the contest the event was judged by a three member jury panel and now it is the time to uh, declare the results for the paper reading competition for this i would now like to invite dr anju chibber coordinator of today's event to introduce and greet the jury members and to take the session forward over to you anju ma'am thank you so much dr preeti am i audible yes ma'am yeah good evening all present over here uh, we have been totally blown away by the response shown by our contestants in the paper reading contest which was held in the morning on wetland conservation the enthusiasm and awareness in the contents contestants was commendable i'm delighted to introduce you all to the panel of our team judges for today's paper reading contest on wetland um, conservation who helped us by performing the most difficult task of choosing the winners of today's contest so i'm overwhelmed to introduce you all to one of our eminent jury members Dr. Pooja Baweja from Maitri College of Delhi University. She is a highly committed and energetic personality with true leadership qualities and integrity. She has 15 years of teaching experience in Delhi University. Thank you, Dr. Pooja, for accepting our invite. To uh, we present her a. Uh, a token of appreciation and a certificate <laughs> dr pooja our students will be more than happy to take your advice and guidance for the future events of the kind so please say a few words of wisdom and enlighten our students pooja ma'am please is pooja ma'am there yeah i think so she is i can see but i think so she has some connectivity issue she is she's not been able to right okay so we move ahead uh, now i introduce you all to a highly proficient uh, and dynamic jury member uh, professor jaslin kaur kalia from dayal singh college uh we would definitely like to take this opportunity to extend our hearty congratulations to professor jaslin for uh, very recently being promoted as a professor in department of botany dayal singh college 
So it's uh, a pride moment for we all. She has more than 18 years of experience in teaching and actively involved in research work too. She is a driving force behind boosting and connecting the young minds to strive towards success and achievement. Thank you, Professor Jasleen, for being with us over here. So we present her also a token of appreciation and certificate. Thank you, ma'am. I now request Professor Jasleen to say a few words and encourage our young minds. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, perhaps uh, she has uh, not been able to get connected, but I can see she's there, okay. Uh, so the most awaited moment has come. I can feel, I can sense curiosity at its peak amongst the contestants. So we have Dr. Shukla Saluja, from Sri Venkateshwara College as our esteemed jury member. She is a leading figure in plant sciences with uh, experience of more than 19 years of teaching in Delhi University. Dr. Shukla, you have been inspirational, not only for students, but for many of us in uh, Delhi University. So thank you for taking out uh, time from your busy college calendar and joining us as a jury member here. We present her a token of <laughs> So without much ado, now I request Dr. Shukla to please announce the results of the contest and motivate the students by saying a few words of encouragement. Shukla ma'am, please. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anju Chipper, for your such kind words of appreciation. I really thanks a lot to you. I, uh, on behalf of the other judges, the other judges are Professor Jasleen Kaul and uh, Dr. Pooja Baveja, would like to thank the teacher in charge, Dr. Aparna Nautial, for giving us this opportunity to be a part of judging the paper reading competition on World Wetlands Day a very relevant topic for today. Organizing such events uh, not only enhances the awareness amongst the students on wetlands significance and conservation uh, amongst the students, but it also helps the students to develop their personality, confidence, and technical skills. Now, while coming to the judgment, I would like to say that it was a very tough competition. All the students, they worked, they gave a very good presentation. They worked very hard and they had put a very good effort from their part. But uh, like all competitions, we have to declare a winner. So in all, a total of eight contestants had participated. And believe me, it was very difficult for us to come to the winners, but uh, we managed to come to the winners. So the first winner for today's competition is uh, Tanya Saxena. So uh, congratulations to Tanya. The second winner for today's paper reading competition on World Wetlands Day is Pratishtha Sajwan. Congratulations. And the third winner for today is uh, Drishant Sen, congratulations. I once again congratulate all the winners and appreciate all the good efforts put by all the contestants. So I would say all the contestants keep working hard, keep uh, motivated, keep, uh, keep getting motivated and inspired and keep working hard. So, uh, and thank you all. I'm 
sorry. Am I audible now? Yes. So thank you, Dr. Shukla, for being with us. Uh, heartiest congratulations to all the participants and winners of the contest. Uh, the feedback form has been floated by now for the webinar. Uh, and you all will receive the certificate the moment you submit the form. In case you uh, can't see your certificate in the inbox of your mail, please check it in the spam mail and report us uh, uh, at the email ID, provide, uh, email ID provided on the poster uh, in case you still not receive it, okay? So uh, uh, with that, uh, I hand over the uh, platform to uh, Ms. Anjana Singh to propose the formal vote of thanks. Anjana, ma'am. Thank you, Anjana, ma'am. A very good evening to one and all present here. It is said that the best kind of giving is thanksgiving. So it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a formal vote of thanks on the occasion of the World Wetlands Day celebrated by the Department of Botany, Deshmandu College. I, Anjana Singh, on behalf of the entire botany department, first of all, spread my most sincere gratitude to the Almighty. A special thanks to our today's chief guest, Dr. Gurmeet Singh, Scientist, Futuristic Research Division, National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India, for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk on significance of seagrass ecosystem and Indian perspective. It was an eye-opening and thought-provoking session, which forces us to think that healthy wetlands are imperative for a healthy earth. Sir, your thoughts have truly inspired us. A big thank you to Professor Rajiv Agarwal, Principal Deshmandu College, for the constant source of energy and inspiration to each one of us. I also wish to express my gratitude for providing incitement to all of us for every activity in the college. You are truly a catalyst and it is immense pleasure to see the growth of our institution under your leadership. I also wish to express my gratitude to Professor Kamal Kumar Gupta, Vice Principal Deshmandu College for providing encouragement at every single event. It is always a pleasure to hear and learn many things from you, sir. On behalf of my college and the entire botany department, a very hearty gratitude to all the judges of the paper reading contest event, Professor Jasleen Kaur Kalia, Professor, Department of Botany, Dayal Singh College, University of Delhi, Dr. Shukla Saluja, Associate Professor, Department of Botany, Sri Venkateshwara College, University of Delhi, Dr. Pooja Baveja Sikri, Assistant Professor, Department of Botany, Maitrey College, University of Delhi, for taking out their precious time to judge the event and sharing their graceful words with us. I also wish to thank the dedicated and well-motivated IQAC coordinator, Dr. Aditya Saxena, and DPT Star College Scheme Coordinator, Dr. Indrakant Singh. You both are a stimulus for the guidance at each, at each step. Further, a big thank you to social media team of college, headed by Professor Varsha Bhavija and technical team, especially Dr. Monica Bajaj, for providing all the support in organizing this event and making it successful. Above and all, my sincere and heartfelt thanks to the captain behind the steering wheels, the teacher in charge of Potney Department, Dr. Aparna Nautial, coordinators, Dr. Anju Chibbar, Dr. Madhurani, and all the faculty members of Potney Department for the upliftment, valuable suggestions, and putting all their efforts in making this event a great success. We are delighted to have with us today teachers from Deshbandhu College and other colleges of Delhi University, Dr. Chandrika Joshi, Professor Varsha Bhavija, Dr. Geeta Mathur, Dr. Charu Khosla, Dr. Aparna Shekhar, Dr. Maku Moran Singh, Dr. Vinita Kashyap, Dr. Priyanka Verma, and many others. My sincere gratitude to you all for your constant motivation and guidance. We cannot carry out any event without the cooperation of our non-teaching staff. Thanks goes to them as well. 
I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for the driving force behind all the events of Botany Department, our students, especially the student council members. They all have really put in their sincere efforts and always taken a lead in making all the departmental events a grand success. Also, my thanks to our alumni students, I can see Ram, Farhan, Lakshman, and others who have joined us today. I would be failing in my duties if I did not thank participants from all over the Delhi University who have made this day possible. I would also like to thank each and every one of you for being here and making this day a wonderful and, me and memorable for us. Thank you once again. My heartful, uh, heartfelt gratitude to you all. I again request all the participants to kindly fill the feedback form, which is shared in the chat box. Now, I humbly request participants to turn on their videos so that we can save the memories of today's event by clicking the photographs. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. So once again, thank you all again to be a part of this event and making it a grand success. Thank you all. Now, I would request the host to end the meeting. Thank you so much.